Alrighty, I will start off. Um, welcome everybody to our biosecurity webinar. Um, I would like to say a very big thank you to Maddie, Callum and Michelle for coming along and also my VEGWA colleague, Mr. Truitt. Um, if we could just go around and introduce ourselves so everyone knows who all the faces are um, and a little bit of a background of what you're doing and where you come from, that'd be awesome. So, Michelle, would you like to start off? Uh, yes, um, so I'm Michelle Portelli and I'm the event coordinator for the International Year of Plant Health. Um, I've worked in hospitality and events for a number of years, um, most recently with the Australia and New Zealand School of Government, um, organising seminars and conferences for their um, regulators, um, community of practice and their thought leadership. Awesome. All righty, Callum. Hi there. Um, my name is Callum Fletcher. I'm the uh, biosecurity coordinator at Ausvich, uh, where I've been working for the past uh, four years on pests and diseases related to vegetables uh, and, and horticulture more generally. Um, I'm an entomologist and prior experience has been uh, my work in New Zealand working on um, grains and, and horticultural uh, insect suck, sap sucking, sucking pests such as aphids, thrips and, and um, psyllids. Maddie, you're up next. One, um, I'm Maddie Quirk from Ausveg and I work as the biosecurity officer there. So working on um, the farm biosecurity project and um, on a vegetable leaf miner project, which I'll be talking a little bit about today. Awesome. And Mr. Truen, would you like to say a little bit in case people uh, don't know yes, who you are? Um, sure. Uh, hi, uh, I am Truen Vo. I work at Vegetable WA as the regional development official on the funding of port innovation and also as the industry development official on the funding of ABC VBC. My role mainly assists with the Vietnamese grower, vegetable grower in WA to help them to get updated information technically or policy or market, whatever you know, relevant to the grower and to treat the communication of the language difficulty with this grower to all other stakeholders involved. Awesome. And yeah, I'm Sam Groovisher. I am the non-Vietnamese Mr. Truant. Um, basically, I work with the English-speaking growers in the same role that Truant does. Okay, let's get on to the presentations. Um, Callum, TPP. Big issue in WA, you're the guy, take it away. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, here we go. Brilliant, is that, is that clear to everyone? Mm -hmm. Very clear. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to talk with you today. I really much uh, deeply appreciate it. And I, I've got to say thank you, a great deal of thank you to, to, to Truan, Mr. Truan, for the wonderful work you've done to translate uh, some of the, 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 the words on this PowerPoint so, into Vietnamese. So um, thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, like I said, my, my background is, is uh, in, in entomology, uh, where I used to work at Plant and Food Research, which is one of the state-owned research companies um, in New Zealand. And this is where I uh, did most of my work on, on tomato potato civet. Unfortunately, that arrived in uh, New Zealand in 2006 and was a cause of, of significant concern and, and, and economic losses uh, for, for a number of years. Actually, really only now uh, are we, uh, as the New Zealand potato and solanaceous and sweet potato, Kumra industries, um, beginning to recover from the, the, the harm that this, this pest has done. Um, so in my role, um, I'm just going to talk today about what this, this, this pest is, um, what, it, what it affects and, and talk about uh, its role in Australia because unfortunately the, the psyllid has uh, arrived, arrived a couple of years ago in West Australia. 
But just before we get to that, I'm just going to talk to you about my, my role more broadly and, and the uh, importance that biosecurity has in protecting the uh, Australian vegetable industry from significant pests and diseases. Because Australia, like New Zealand, is a, is a, is a lucky country in the sense that we do not have as many uh, of the, the pests and diseases that other countries have. And that, that provides a, a, a great uh, competitive advantage to our industries, uh, that we do not have to spend uh, significant cost of finances on, on pest and disease management for some of the worst diseases and, and insect pests uh, in the world. Um, and also helps with us uh, a clean and greener uh, image that, that we use to sell our produce uh, throughout the world. So here we are. Um, this is a photo of me with uh, a number of um, Cambodian growers in West, uh, New South Wales. Uh, my project that I work on with Maddie, who will be speaking later. Would you please uh, speak a little bit louder, Callum? Yep. Sure. Yeah, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, my project that I work on with, with Matty Quick, who will be speaking uh, next, uh, is run until 2023. It's a uh, project funded through uh, with the uh, Department of Plant Health Australia and um, the Department of Agriculture. And it's about promoting on-farm biosecurity for the vegetable and potato industries. Uh, basically, improving our preparedness so that when something new does come into the country, uh, we are in a better position to be able to manage it, to detect it when it first arrives, to contain it and to eradicate it. And if that isn't, is not possible, to restrict its movement from the, the uh, impacted state, or even when that level is, is unable to be achieved, that growers have the tools necessary uh, and, and the resources available so that they can protect their own properties from the arrival of these pests and diseases. Uh, it may not be possible with some winged insects, but certainly with soil-borne pests and pathogens, that's um, something that um, can be achieved and, and maintained at significant financial benefit to those, those growers who can, who can keep a pest, uh, these significant diseases out. Uh, a good illustration of this would be uh, a potato cyst nematode, which has been a significant problem for those growers affected in, in Victoria, but for the wider industry, because it's a soil-borne uh, 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 nematode, uh, has not been um, a major issue for, for growers uh, growing potatoes around the rest of the country. Um, so what we do is work on work, work, uh, do workshops and grower visits, produce resources and information, and, and now as a result of this, um, uh, current incursion uh, so of, of, of um, COVID-19, um, we are uh, also doing a number of uh, uh, webinars. So this may be knowledge to most people, uh, the, the vegetable industry is significant, uh, significantly large in Australia, uh, 3.57 million tonnes produced, value of $4.3 billion. Uh, growing industry an important industry and one of these industries that can be knocked over if a new pest and disease or disease comes in and, and wipes out uh, the profitability of those industries. I do not want Australia to be in a situation that New Zealand was in with the arrival of, of tomato potato psyllid which uh, really did put uh, uh, those, those growers affected by it at a significant disadvantage, closed market access to, to exports and, and has really been a point of pain and suffering and concern and financial loss for those, those growers for, for a number of years. Um, here we can see an uh, illustration in, in grey of the, the growing areas for vegetables, the major growing areas for vegetables. Um, as you can see, um, they are, many of them, or most of them, are very close to the major urban centres of Australia. This provides greater risk to the industries because the primary pathway in which uh, new exotic uh, pest and diseases arrives in, uh, into the country are through air travel and sea travel. Uh, many, many, many uh, shipping containers and flights up until this uh, shutdown have been coming into those uh, those major urban areas, um, and it's not a short jump 
to the major vegetable and horticultural growing regions that surround our, our major cities. So when we have an incursion, it's usually first detected in the ports um, or around there, um, and then it, it moves rapidly into the, the uh, highly productive growing regions. Now this is this is key. Uh, this is this, this doesn't provide industry with uh, much time or warning before uh, they're having to deal with a new pest. Uh, similarly, you can also see that uh, most of our um, vegetable production is for um, uh, national or, or consumption, with uh, not much, maybe 5% going into exports. Here we are, here's another illustration where the major ports are all around the coast and where our major growing regions are. When I talk about incursions, uh, here are a number that uh, you may be familiar with uh, that have had an impact on the vegetable growing industries uh, more recently. Now, uh, Maddie, Maddie will be speaking about vegetable leaf miner down, down the bottom right. Um, I will be talking about tomato potato salad, but other ones that we may be familiar with, such as cucumber green model mosaic virus, has been an ongoing concern for um, the curbit growers uh, throughout the country. It came into uh, Northern Territory in 2014 and led to uh, quarantine for a number of growers. And since then, periodic uh, um, arrivals or, 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 or um, shows up periodically uh, elsewhere around the country. And this has led to uh, restrictions on trade to New Zealand, a major source of money uh, for the, the industry and, and significant lockdowns at, at, at great cost to those, um, those uh, producers. Uh, Varroa mite, including Jacob Sona, and also Varroa destructor, which is the more uh, harmful uh, mite. Uh, both of these have been found. And as a good illustration of eradication, where detection has occurred quickly, there have been efforts made to find where it is present, where it is not present, and eradicate that. And these have been very successful. Number of number of uh, incursions have happened for Devaro Mike Jacob Sonai in Queensland near Townsville, and each one of those ones has been successfully uh, found, detected, and eradicated. So that industry does not have to deal with this. Similarly, another late major incursion occurred in Port Phillip Bay outside of Melbourne, um, which was er detected early and eradicated. The benefit to this is that Australia is one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have to deal with this pest of our major uh, pollinators, being uh, European honeybees. And so additional costs that every other country in the world has to, to pay in order to protect those pollinators is, is not necessarily uh, uh, needed uh, in Australia. The longer we keep it that way, the better we are as an industry and the better can be advantages what we have. Now, here are some others, and I will get, I'm conscious of time limits here, but uh, these are other ones, uh, other incursions that uh, we, uh, high priority pests that we're worried about in the country. Brown, brown marmorated stink bug is something that comes in regularly uh, and has been a major source of concern. Um, similarly, uh, Colorado potato beetle is uh, one that we are quite concerned about as well. Just to give you an illustration though, if you look down, I know this is a complicated chart, but this is the detections that the Federal Department of Agriculture uh, has found at the border um, prior, to, prior to coming into the country uh, of a range of, of exotic plant pests and, 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 and issues. Third, to the, uh, third from the bottom um, is our marmorated stink bug. And as you can see that there, there are 385 detections. Now these are detections, they're not the number of bugs. One, one detection could be potentially thousands of bugs. So this gives you an illustration about how uh, we are constantly under threat from new arrivals. These have been successfully intercepted at our borders. And so Australian growers have not had to to deal with this and we have not, and it has not led to an incursion response, which is when a, a, a pest gets outside of, uh, gets through our borders and into the environment and needs to be um, contained and eradicated. So as you can see, our border, border security um, is constantly uh, under pressure. So one pest that successfully managed to avoid detection at our borders 
and uh, establish itself in West Australia in 2016 was the tomato potato salad. And this is what I'm going to be about um, for the rest of the day. Okay. So, as I mentioned, it arrived in New Zealand in 2006. Uh, and there's a range of mul uh, multiple hosts, uh, including solanaceous crops such as capsicums, tomatoes, um, eggplant, chilies, uh, and uh, potatoes, along with um, sweet potato, which, which is not solanaceous. Um, it's two to three millimeters long, and it, it's um, very small and a, and a major, major pest. Here's some illustrations of the size relative to the five cent piece. Uh, and it basically looks uh, from a distance like a small winged aphid, or up close it looks like a, a miniature cicada um, with strong hind legs. And I'll get to, to talking about that in the future, about what to look for and how to survey for these, for these tiny little pests. Here we have the, uh, the young, or the nymphs. Um, there are five stages in stars where, where the, the nymph uh, grows. Uh, on, the, on the left, you can see them, a couple of stages there. Um, and on the right, you can see the fifth star, fifth in star with those yellow and wing pads next to, next to an out there. So they are quite distinctive. They look like small scale insects um, and can be found on the underside of the leaves, primarily on, on the mid-range uh, leaves of a plant. Now, just as I mentioned before, uh, I mentioned the strong hind legs of, of, of the psyllid, uh, the psyllid adult. When, when you look into a crop, you may see them, they're you know, quite clearly noticeable there, um, as you can see with that white, strong white band across the, their back. Um, now, because of their hind legs, if they're disrupted, they tend to jump 30 centimeters high and, and fly off. So it's, it's important to take care when looking in your crop to see whether uh, not disturbing the plant, looking to the top side of the leaves on the, on the uppermost leaves usually to see if you can see anything that looks like that, uh, the, the adult psyllid with that white band. Uh, after you've done that, then uh, look to the underside uh, of, of the leaves where we might see some of the, the nymphs which don't move very much. So you, disturbing them will, will not cause them to, to, to move away. Other symptoms uh, or signs of the psyllid are, are the eggs. Now these are incredibly small as you can see here, but one distinctive feature of them is that they are laid on the edge uh, of, of the leaf and they have this small stalk connecting them to the um, to the plant. Um, they do look slightly similar to lacewing eggs, but they are reasonably distinctive um, and certainly something to keep an eye out for. When people ask me, you know, what to look for primarily for presence of the psyllid, I would say psyllid uh, sugars. These are the result of those nymphs feeding on, on um, the plant and they secrete a, a sugary substance uh, in, on, on the tomatoes or e anywhere else. Now, especially if you're working in covered crops or, or some form of sheltered cropping, um, these, these symptoms will be quite distinct. Uh, unless there's been strong winds and rain that washes them away, there should be signs like this uh, of psyllid feeding. Um, and, and, and also accompanying that may be some sooty mold as well. Um, so certainly something just noticeable and distinctive that you keep an eye out for when, when walking around the crops and you won't, you know, it should be um, quite clear. Now today, like I mentioned, the psyllid arrived in uh, West Australia uh, a couple of years ago. It has spread to uh, Carnarvon, Geraldton up in the north, um, and Albany um, and potentially Esperance out in the, uh, in the east. Um, uh, Bunbury, Brusselton, Manjima, um, other areas, and certainly all around the Perth uh, area. Um, so uh, the, the, what happened was that the initial detection occurred in, in Perth, um, 
efforts were made. Uh, I was brought over by the, the Federal Department of Agriculture to aid the West Australian Department of Agriculture in their eradication efforts. Unfortunately, because the psyllid had been present for, for uh, a while, it was in such large numbers that it was unable to be eradicated. Uh, and, and, but this has led to some, uh, it's a shame. But that's right. I'll get to what has been done as a result and, and ongoing uh, from the arrival of, of this uh, psyllid. But just here, I want to talk to you that I'm, I'm, from discussions with industry in West Australia, Turin has, has, has raised the issue of psyllid yellows. Now, psyllid yellows are the impact of the feeding of the psyllid on, on the leaves. Now, as you can show you some clear pictures here, um, the yellowing of the plant. So what psyllid yellows is, is basically the psyllid releases a toxic saliva um, that has, uh, that, that flows through the plant and significant feeding from large numbers of psyllids can be uh, very harmful to, to the plant. Uh, the more feeding, the greater the harm uh, can lead to plant death. Um, it's particularly uh, pronounced in uh, tomatoes uh, along with with potatoes, it uses it causes uh, restricted growth, um, uh, stunting. Um, in the case of potato, potatoes, uh, lower numbers and misshapen tubers are produced. And in case of tomatoes, uh, you can see here on the on the right image there down the bottom, uh, uh, um, basically smaller size and uh, darker skin uh, color, along with a reduced flavor. So basically this is uh, the result of just the psyllid in feeding in large numbers. And, you know, as you can see, it's a very significant and clear uh, symptom. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's certainly something to be concerned about. Um, the other thing that the psyllid can uh, to carry is, is a zebra chip. It's basically the, the bacteria candidatus liberia, the Salinaceae. Now, this is a, a, a bacteria uh, that will cause uh, yellowing uh, and browning and, and blackening of, of potato tubers uh, and, and be, lead to them being unable to be uh, processed into, into French fries, causing significant harm to the potato industry. Similarly, the, the bacteria can cause stunting and distortion of fruit, uh, cupping of leaves and, 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 and sickness in all the other uh, solanaceous um, host crops. So when we discuss the psyllid, we think about the bacteria that, uh, that it carries as well. Now, today I want to just make clear that um, although Australia does not have that bacteria, significant testing has been uh, uh, conducted found to not be present. It's the only country in the world that uh, has the psyllid and not the uh, associated bacteria. But the, the symptoms of the bacteria, and if we go back to the, uh, the yellows, are very are quite similar. And, and even without the bacteria, that, that yellowing, the psyllid yellows, is a major uh, cause of, of yield loss and, 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 and distress for, for growers. So I want to make it quite clear that although we don't have the bacteria, the psyllid in and of itself is a significant problem to industry. And Australia has a perfect climate for, for psyllid growth. Basically, the, it doesn't get cold enough for psyllids to go into high, uh, to stasis. And so that you can have year-long um, population and generational growth leading to incredibly large numbers as what as have we found in, in West Australia where up to 3,000 psyllids have been found on one small sticky trap. Um, right, as I mentioned before, here are the host crops, um, the major ones, uh, and sweet potatoes is noticeable as being uh, an additional uh, target. And it's been a real issue for both the um, and especially in New Zealand for the, um, for the um, sweet potato and grower industry. Another thing to note here is the non-crop host plants, the, the weed hosts that, that psyllids can survive on. Uh, Nightshade is a significant one. Boxthorn, which is another common head, is, um, is another. Now, what happens with these is that the psyllid is able to overwinter or survive in these host plants, um, host weed crops, um, on your property. 
so that even when you desiccate or get rid of your crop or harvest your crop, they can wait there, survive over winter quite happily, or survive over a period of time when there's no food, and then come back in large numbers and, and decimate a, a, a young crop um, very early on in the growing season. So these are, these are significant um, uh, hosts to keep an eye out for, just uh, and, and to see if there's any signs of, of psyllid presence on your property. Another way of, of, of making understanding or seeing whether uh, psyllids are present, as I mentioned, monitoring the crop, looking at the top of the leaves, see the, that distinctive white band. Now, another way, and probably the most effective means by which you can detect the presence of psyllids is to use these yellow sticky traps. Seen here with a protective case to, to stop uh, birds or, or, or lizards getting stuck on them. The bright yellow is the most effective colour at attracting psyllids. Uh, they're basically drawn to it. And uh, blue sticky traps are also available on the market, but are not as um, effective at, at detecting a, a psyllid uh, or attracting a psyllid or reflecting the presence of psyllids in your crop. You'll note here, uh, the most effective place to put them is just about two metres in from the edge of your crop. Psyllids tend to fly in, uh, established on the edge of, of, a, of a host crop and not really move. Um, so the best place for to look and detect, detect them is around the edges of the crop. Um, this leads to interesting symptoms when you, you, you look at a crop. As I said, the yellowing of, and stunting of the plants, psyllids tend to stay where they, they land and less disturbed. So what you'll see in an affected crop is individual plants uh, highly infested with psyllids uh, and, and, and sick looking plants uh, in one of, you know, by themselves. Uh, different from say virus, virus infection, which you'll have patches of multiple plants um, uh, together, usually tends to be just a singular um, stunted plant, peppered around, uh, a peppered around the, the, the crop. Of course, this still leads to significant yield loss because the numbers of those plants affected are deeply affected, significantly affected, and, and can increase uh, without um, crop management. Now, when I mentioned that the presence of psyllid was uh, the, the CLSO, the bacteria causing a Z chip, is not present in Australia, uh, significant effort has been made by the West Australian governments, along with the other states uh, and territories, to survey for, for, for psyllids and the presence of that bacteria. It has, psyllid has not been found in any other state apart from West Australia. Uh, and where it has been found in West Australia, those psyllids have been tested, uh, thousands, 30,000 uh, or over 30,000 have been tested for the presence of this bacteria and none have been found to, to have it. So at the moment, Australia is in an enviable position that we don't have the bacteria that could make this problem a whole lot worse. So the testing is continuing, ongoing. Every summer season, the Department of Agriculture in West Australia will submit thousands of psyllids in, in spring and autumn to uh, PCR testing uh, to see if the, if this, the bacteria has arrived. And so far, that has not. Like I said, now we have to deal with this uh, issue uh, and manage it. Uh, Significant money has been uh, given by the levy, the, the vegetable levy, the federal government and state government mentioned to, to provide a range of research into pest and uh, management of this, of this uh, issue. Um, now, some work has, was done um, over, over a couple of years straight after the arrival of the psyllid, um, including literature reviews, understanding of the presence of local um, um, tax uh, of psyllid numbers and, um, and, pro and really uh, the effectiveness of um, biological and, and chemical control options for the psyllid. Here you have ladybugs eating, um, eating the psyllid. And what the research has found is that there are a range of, of chemical options that are effective uh, at managing the psyllid. Um, some of which are soft, such as your type 28s and 23s, uh, that don't uh, do as much harm to the beneficial predators, um, which prey on them. Um, as, uh, and so can work together um, 
to to help manage silid numbers in your in your crop. But as I see, as you can see here, a range including lacewings, uh, uh, larvae, and and um, the generous predators, uh, uh, ladybugs, do a good job of eating silids and managing their populations. They're not usually sufficient to completely control the issue, so uh, a, a chemical control option certainly may be necessary. Um, in New Zealand, um, fundamentally necessary, uh, basically because uh, of the psyllid hide breeding rate, um, many generations and many, many eggs are laid uh, throughout the season, um, so that the range of chemical control options decrease because of the, the concern about using multiple, um, multiple um, applications of the same chemistry leading to resistance. So what's happened is that uh, large numbers of, of, of sprays have been used along with um, hopefully um, the reliance on, on introduced and, 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 and supported beneficial numbers so that those beneficials can play prey on the psyllid uh, and, and be supported by a soft chemical application that doesn't kill them, but does manage to control those psyllid numbers. So there we are, That's the, the, the chemical range uh, is reasonably broad, um, using some older chemistry, but also some of the more modern ones. And um, it can help um, growers uh, manage this significant piece. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate the, uh, your attention and um, Thank you. Is there any questions? I have a quick question. With the bacteria, how is that transmitted? Like, if we don't have the bacteria now, how could we get the bacteria that causes the zebra chicks? Well, unfortunately, we don't know exactly how the psyllid got to Australia. Research was conducted in New Zealand as to what was the most likely pathway. Yeah. The molecular diagnosis or analysis found that there was five separate incursions over a, a, a period of a year, uh, all of which came from, most likely came from California. Uh, it's the same biotype, the Western biotype of, of the psyllid uh, that was found in California, and it was found in New Zealand. Now, most likely hypothesis or, or pathway was that people smuggling in chilies uh, uh, for, for eating uh, and, and growing um, and, and the psyllid nymph was able to survive on the calyx or the, the top of, of the fruit. Now that means they got here by to New Zealand by aeroplane. Now that could be the same pathway that, that came to West Australia. Um, we don't know. It, it, we know that it is uh, related to the psyllid populations in New Zealand. But either way, however it got here, it only requires one psyllid to have be hot with the bacteria, to have the, the psyllid present in, in, in its gut uh, in order for it to introduce the, the bacteria into a host plant. And then because it is persistent, any other psyllids feeding on that, other tomato, potato psyllid, uh, feeding on that, will able to, to ingest it and then transmit that bacteria into the environment uh, to plants uh, over again and again and again. So the risk is that if introduced, then it would spread like wildfire because the significantly large numbers of psyllids that are existing in, 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 the, in the West Australian population. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question too. Uh, you can stop the screen share now, so we can do, we can see you more clearly. Okay. <laughs> they, um, the grower practice the grower now practicing the spray program for the other setting insect like um, millibird and for mite as well, and the chemical they use now I find it within the list of the permit used for TPP. Do the grower actually need to develop the special spray program for TPP? And if they have to do so, what are the recommended indicator for them to start the spray program, like the number of chili stuck on the yellow tap, or what kind of symptom of 
what kind of indicator that for the grower to use to start the spray program, particularly for TPP? Well, New Zealand has led the way in, in, in relying on degree day calculations. This is basically uh, using temperature to, to calculate the, the, the point where the psyllid populations will, will be high enough uh, based on, on, on weather conditions in the, your particular growing region um, to, to know when that threshold is reached. Now, unfortunately, there hasn't been much research into this calculation process, but I, I, I think that's certainly something that, that would be worth pursuing in, in West Australia. Uh, Potatoes New Zealand provides this service to, to growers and basically provides alerts when uh, the likelihood is, is high. Given that we don't have that option, the, the standard method is that you, there, there's more than four adult psyllids in an, a trap uh, and four traps uh, per, per paddock. So that, that threshold is the point where um, New Zealand industry will, will start to, to apply uh, chemical control. And usually best management with that is to utilize those chemical classes that are soft and do not kill beneficial predators um, in those early stages. So using your type 28s, type 26, uh, uh, sorry, 23, uh, other soft chemistry early on so that the beneficial numbers get to grow up uh, early in, in the season. They have, they have psyllids still to feed on, but they're not being attacked. Um, and so those, those beneficials can then aid those soft chemicals uh, in managing that impact, especially when the crop is young and more susceptible to, to both bacterial impact or, or the psyllid yellow, uh, yellowing uh, uh, impact. Only late in the season, if absolutely necessary, should you switch to those more broad, broad spectrum um, chemical classes. Uh, another quick question, please. Do you know, is there any uh, service to provide a biological control to the grower? Um, LTBB actually. Yeah. Yes, uh, now I, I think, um, I believe that uh, maybe uh, bikes, I'm not sure the chemical, uh, the chemical company, but yes, certainly the, the, um, there is a uh, provider uh, who helped um, conduct these, these chemical uh, and beneficial uh, trials um, and, and they provide a commercial service of, of, of being able to release uh, rear up and release uh, large numbers of generalist um, predators. And as what we've found in uh, in Australia is that there aren't any specific predators of of the psyllid. There is one in its native Mexico called Tamarixia triosa, which which preys specifically on tomato potato psyllid. This has been approved for release in New Zealand uh, by the EPA and and has been uh, introduced. Um, to, um, I guess, mixed results. Uh, it's good, it's, it's effective, but highly susceptible to um, insecticide drift, drift and, and that leads to um, potential of, of decimating those uh, hard to build up populations. In Australia, that's not available. So we have to rely on the, on the generalist predators, but because you can uh, purchase uh, large numbers of these bred, bred up um, generalist predators, then certainly that may be an option for growers uh, and a tool in their management kit. And sorry for too much question, a lot of question for me. What are your recommendations to the grower to first prevent the TPP to enter their farm property? and strictly to reduce the damage or to actually kill or eradicate the TPP out of their farm? Yeah, that's a great question, Truan, because it's not just for TPP, it's more broadly, like I said, protecting your property from pests and diseases. They don't have to be exotics, they can just be uh, uh, pests that are present, but you know, there are certainly a range of th uh, things that, that, are, that a grower can do to in, increase their protection and, 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 and uh, uh, lower the chances of the arrival of, 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 of pests and diseases um, that lower the probability. Um, we talk about uh, wash down facilities, 
uh, controlling movement on your property, uh, sourcing reputable seed, uh, seed and nursery uh, supplies. All of these things can, uh, can improve it. Now, like I mentioned before, it's not a soil-borne pathogen. It is winged. It will get to your, potentially get to your property on its own power. Now, that's nothing, you cannot do anything about that. But I say the best method then is to use constant surveillance. So putting out yellow sticky traps, looking in your crop, looking for those yellow sugary symptoms. And then if you do see something that might look a bit odd, going and not disturbing and just looking at looking for the presence of those solids. But certainly, I mean, that's, that's generally, I'd recommend for all winged insects, surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. Uh, and then combining that with uh, you know, a sound biosecurity plan, farm gate signs, um, and, and basically using reputable uh, seed and, and nursery stock uh, to help make sure that your farm is, is more, less likely to be impacted. Thank you very much, Callum. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Callum. That was really cool. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank and you so much. I I am just going to say today was uh, an anniversary because you were over here on the 6th of May last year doing a biosecurity update. So let's keep it going. We'll have you over here. We'll have, we'll have you over here, hopefully, for a face to face again next year. So thank you very much. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle, the year of plant health. Thanks, Sam. Talk um, about that. <laughs> yes, definitely. So um, the United Nations and FAO declared 2020 the International Year of Plant Health. So this was a first time ever um, that the focus has been on plant health and an amazing opportunity to raise um, global awareness on how um, protecting plant health can um, have major benefits um, it can help end hunger, help reduce poverty, it protects the environment um, and it boosts economic development. Um, so luckily I've been given this task <laughs> to uh, coordinate events. Um, I was working with, or I still am working with industry and growers to raise awareness of the year um, and also with the, to, to educate the general public um, just how important plant health is. Um, biosecurity just isn't up to the grower or the scientists or the Department of Agriculture. Um, biosecurity is reliant on everybody being aware of their surroundings. So if they're going to a farm gate, what their responsibilities are. If they're going to a vineyard, what their responsibilities are. Um, and just the impacts it can have on those crops, on those vines. Um, and as a layperson, I didn't know any of that. So I'm really being educated on that um, and how important it is. Um, because we have a shared responsibility, as Callum was saying. Um, the impacts can be tremendous, um, especially with trade. Um, these pests and bugs don't have boundaries. They don't stop at your farm gate. They don't stop at your border. And they definitely don't stop within our country. So it can have an, a huge impact on trade nationally and internationally. And that's what we're hoping to raise awareness of. Um, so we, we had been organising events around Australia. Um, they've had to be pushed back. So we've gone, we've turned to social media. So we do have resources available on the Plant Health Year website. We have um, a Twitter account that's been established and we're tweeting as much as we can. So anybody that wants to get involved, um, growers, industries, the RDCs, um, they're welcome to contact me. Um, I'd love to work with them, get their research out there, get their findings out there, um, give them more of a platform, basically. Um, and then once the events come back up and running, we do have some events that we're hoping to run. Um, I've spoken to some growers throughout Australia. We were looking at um, replanting um, school vegetable gardens that were fire affected. Um, so we've had growers um, promise um, plant life um, so that we can get in there. Um, we're hoping to do a ceremonial tree planting at the end of the year to commemorate the year because it is a huge, a huge year for us. Um, and just coordinating the RDC, coordinating with the RDCs 
um, to get their events out there as well so that um, the growers know what's going on within their industry, um, finding out what research is available, what tools there are for them. Um, because, you know, having spoken to some growers that, you know, they'll sort of say to you, well, where do I find this information? So getting that information out to them um, and just creating a community um, where everybody's got that information available. Um, hopefully we will have an international uh, plant health day every year. We're working on that. Um, but anything we can do to raise the awareness of biosecurity needs and plant health and um, how important that is because um, the general public look at the vegetables that they have at the supermarkets and at the, um, at the markets and, and think, oh, you know, that's great. But the work that's involved to get those fruit and vegetables and, and grains to them the background, that's what we need to educate them on and that's what hopefully Plant Health, um, International Year of Plant Health can do for them. Um, and just grow the, you know, grow the industry, give the recognition that the industry deserves basically um, because it is, biosecurity is huge um, and we need to, to make people aware of that and how important it is. So yeah, um, and as I said, we all need to practice good biosecurity. Um, and we, not, we need to get our growers working um, with biosecurity in mind, um, you know, because that they're the first instance. They're going to they're, they're going to get the early detection. They're, they're going to notice the changes, um, and we need to give them the tools and the contacts um, to make those changes. Um, and hopefully, we'll have a few more events that we can let you know about later in the year, as long as COVID's all over. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much. And massive shout out to all of the growers that are offering plants to schools. I think that's awesome. <laughs> like get kids playing in dirt. It doesn't get better than that. Exactly. That's how, <laughs> that's how all kids should grow up, I reckon. They should know where those vegetables came from and yeah. how they grow, which they don't. Yeah. So fingers Same crossed we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, Michelle. That's Not awesome. No Thank and you for the time. I'm, I'm sure I will have to check with our fabulous comms girls and techie for today, but I'm sure we'll be able to get some of your details out on the end of this webinar. So, yeah. That would be sure great. That and get the info out. The more people involved, the better it is. Fantastic. Thanks, Sam. No worries. And last but definitely not least is Maddie with Leaf Miner and maybe a little bit of the newest nasty, which is for armyworm. Yep. <laughs> All right. I'll just share my screen. Um, okay. Um, can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Very clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thanks for having me on the webinar today. I'll be talking about um, a Hort Innovation funded project for vegetable leaf miner preparedness, as well as a full armyworm update. And thank you, Truen, um, for translating um, this PowerPoint into Vietnamese. It was a really good job, thank you. So um, just first to talk about the vegetable leaf miner project. Um, leaf miners um, are well-known pests, particularly overseas, and they um, have the potential to pose a significant threat to Australia's agricultural industries. So two of these exotic leaf miners, um, serpentine leaf miner and American serpentine leaf miner are not currently present in Australia, but they're found in neighboring countries such as Indonesia. Um, however, vegetable leaf miner is a threat that is, um, has made its way to Australia. Um, in 2015, it was found on the mainland and um, it is under quarantine um, in Northern Queensland in Seisha on the Cape York Peninsula. So a little bit about the life cycle of exotic leaf miners. Um, there's the egg, larval, pupil and um, adult stages. So the life cycle can be as short as three weeks, um, but, and it can also have multiple generations per um, growing season. So you can see here in this little moving GIF that this is a larva, a, larva, a vegetable leaf miner larva, um, between the top and bottom layers of a leaf. Um, this creates that um, really significant and 
primary damage um, called like the leaf mining damage, which is white sparring leaf mines, which you can see in this image on the right hand side of the screen. Um, in addition to that damage though, there's um, a, a damage called stippling, which is actually, which occurs as a result of the female adult laying her eggs, but also feeding. So you can, it's a little bit hard to spot them, but you can see there those little circular white dots on that right hand side um, image. Um, all exotic leaf miners have a number of um, host crops that they attack. So for vegetable leaf miner specifically, there's some examples listed here. Um, and yeah, sorry, eggplant, capsicum, chili, are some of the examples, as well as ornamental cut flowers um, and actually a number of weed hosts as well. So at the plant level, um, there's a number of impacts that can um, occur to the plant, including disruption of photosynthesis um, and the stippling that I talked about on the previous slide. Um, it can, the leaf miners can actually cause excessive mining, which will lead to um, stunting of growth or failure to fruit, but also can, can kill the plant entirely. And this is quite common in young plants, um, as Callum mentioned for tomato potato psyllid as well. Um, they're very susceptible to, um, to attacks um, from leaf miner. At the farm level, um, some of the impacts include farm quarantine um, and obviously a reduction in yield of, of your crop. Um, on top of that, a loss of marketability is common as well because especially for those crops that um, have the, that sell the leaf as part of their plant um, and overseas, um, pest management has been quite costly due to resistance to a number of chemicals, which I will talk a little bit about um, later. Um, just relating this back to the real world, for an example, um, Liramiza trifolia, American serpentine leaf miner, cost the Californian ornamental growers industry um, 21 million per year when it first hit um, California. So, <clears throat> What is causing these um, high, such high losses? Well, I like to use this um, study as an example. So it's Chirinos et al, 2017. This is a bean plant and the left-hand image has little to no leaf mining damage, whereas the right-hand image you can see is significantly impacted by um, vegetable leaf miner. Um, so it might come as a surprise to know that the right-hand image is actually, has actually been used, um, sprayed with chemicals, whereas the left-hand hasn't. Um, so what's happening here is in, in the natural environment, vegetable leaf miner is held in check relatively well by parasitoid wasps, which act as those beneficial um, biocontrol for the, for the leaf miner. But when the chemicals are sprayed, um, particularly the SPs and the OPs, they're knocking out um, not only the vegetable leaf miner, but the parasitoid wasps as well. Um, if, they, if these sprays can't get to the vegetable leaf miner larva, they, kill, they can't kill them off. So when, when they're sprayed, the adults may die, but um, larvae are growing up, pupating and becoming um, adults and really becoming prolific in um, the environment once again. And this is what we call a secondary pest. So uh, leaf miners are secondary pests where by in their natural environment, then they're not really causing too many issues until something is introduced such as a chemical and um, causing those secondary outbreaks. Um, and yeah, these, this is happening time and time again in overseas examples where chemical mismanagement um, is leading to destruction of parasitoids. So now with a bit of that background, um, I'll talk a little bit about what the project is. So it's a Hort Innovation funded project for preparedness for the vegetable leaf miner. It started in 2017 and is um, set to finish at the end of this year in November. The project lead is Caesar, and um, they're working with um, the University of Melbourne, Plant Health Australia, the Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy and um, Ausveg, which is where I work. Um, Initially, it was just focusing on vegetable leaf miner, but we then um, got a variation to cover other exotic leaf miners as well. Um, so I will highlight a few areas of our project um, that we've been working on and some of the results. One of the major areas we've been working on is estimating what is the actual risk of vegetable leaf miner in various regions. So what's the risk going to look like in Western Australia? Um, 
in order to um, create these models, we, we're using information that we've taken from the bi biology of the pest and putting this together um, with Australia's climate and what we know about Australia's climate to work out um, if vegetable leaf miner can grow and establish in a particular environment. So we came up with this map um, of Australia and the red regions indicate um, very low to little to no growth potential for leaf miners. Um, and the dark green indicates very high potential. So I've zoomed in on Western Australia, where you can see I'm taking Perth, Geraldton and Carnarvon as some examples. You can see in Perth and um, Geraldton, it's, you're going to have a higher risk of leaf miner growth than you would in Carnarvon. Um, so talking a little bit more about this, um, you, we've got these three regions on, on um, a little graphic there where it's um, honing in on the seasonal risk. So for Perth, the seasonal risk is going to be greatest in that spring and autumn time. Um, and the climate is gonna be unsuitable in winter and also unsuitable in summer for growth of vegetable leaf miner. In Geraldton, you've got about half the year being suitable and half the year not being suitable for growth of leaf miner. Um, and in Carnarvon, um, pretty much the entire year is unsuitable for the growth of vegetable leaf miner. But if you do compare these to a region in Queensland, Bundaberg, where um, the predicted growth is very high, um, especially in that October, November, December time, you can see that the green areas in Perth and Geraldton are not as dark, which is meaning that um, the growth potential is still a little bit lower, which is why the overall risk um, we've allocated to Perth and Geraldton regions um, is moderate and then Carnarvon is low. You can explore these predictions a little bit further. Um, we've got a link here to Caesar's website where they've got the model up and running, which is a really exciting tool. Um, in addition to estimating the risk of leaf miner, we're also looking into um, how you can prepare yourself by um, undertaking surveillance for leaf miner. So visual surveillance is going to be more important um, by looking at the plant not so much by looking for the pest itself because they're tiny, one to two millimetres and very hard to see with the naked eye. Um, this, is going, this means that early reporting is crucial um, in order to detect those unusual symptoms, but also to act quickly and get um, an integrated pest management plan in place. Um, on top of that, um, it's always important to save some of the collect some of the leaf samples and keep them um, when you report them to the exotic plant pest hotline um, because throughout the project we've actually developed some really cool DNA tests um, where you can where we can find the DNA from the empty leaf mine rather than having to have the larvae um, or the adult leaf miner um, there to use the DNA so we're still working on those as part of the project. Um, a survey guide with more detail on all of this is available on the Ausveg website, but I can also email it to anyone who's interested and my contact details will be at the end of this presentation. Um, so talking about, uh, I guess, looking into management of leaf miner, future management of vegetable leaf miner, biological control is going to be crucial, as I talked about in that previous slide with that study example. Um, natural control is going to be absolutely fundamental. So as part of our research, we've come across, um, we've found that there are more than six species up in the incursion front of Torres Strait and Seisha um, on the Cape York Peninsula that are controlling vegetable leaf miner right now. Um, and in these regions, the unassisted mortality rates, we're seeing um, they're reaching as high as 80% mortality of vegetable leaf miner as a result of um, the parasitoid wasps. On top of that, some of our desktop research has found that um, there are 50 plus wasp species in Australia at the moment that could potentially control leaf miner in the future. Um, some of these, most of these species are well known um, parasitoids overseas, but some of them are our own unique Australian species that are already controlling leaf miner up in um, the incursion front. And a, a couple of those species are down on the right hand side there. Um, so chemical control may play a part in um, control of leaf miner, but um, making wasps safe choices is crucial. So as to minimize the disruption to um, our parasitoid populations that exist in Australia. 
Um, this is going to mean using um, systemic or translaminal insecticides instead of um, SPs and OPs and things like that, because they can target the larvae, not just the adult. Um, yeah, so the, resistant, uh, the resistance levels, which I've talked about already, are quite high to those SPs and OPs. Um, so just making sure we're mindful about our choices. Um, in addition to that, Plant Health Australia has actually submitted some um, minor use permits or extended some permits. So that, that list is here. Um, if you do want more detail on that, I can provide you that um, as a follow-up as well. Um, but it's also in this um, chemical control package that we have developed for growers, um, agronomists and others in the industry. So to summarise on leaf miner, just before I talk briefly about fall armyworm, um, there are a number of exotic leaf miners around the world um, and they affect a number of crops. One leaf miner has unfortunately hit our shores um, and is up in the Torres Strait and Seisha, Cape York Peninsula in Queensland, under quarantine up there. Um, leaf miners in general are easier to detect based on um, the damage that they create rather than looking at the pest itself. So um, that means it's crucial to report things early, um, especially if you see unusual symptoms in your crop. Um, biological control agents, specifically parasitoid wasps, are going to play a really important role in an integrated pest management approach to vegetable leaf miner management in Australia. Okay, um, so on to fall armyworm, which you may, have, you may have heard of by now. It's an invasive um, insect species and it affects more than 350 hosts, which is, which is a lot. <laughs> um, it's native to tropical and subtropical regions of the Americas, but it's spread to Africa, India, China, and Southeast Asia since 2016. In 2020, this year, it was detected in the Torres Strait Islands and since spread across various parts of Queensland, um, then Northern Territory, and now in Western Australia, Kununurra, Broome, and very recently um, in Carnarvon. So um, a little bit on the life cycle um, and various life stages of the fall armyworm. So it, it, it has egg, larval, pupil, and adult stages. Um, adult is a moth. So for eggs, um, they're very, very small and um, they'll be, they're laid in 100 to 200, um, a group of 100 or 200 under the leaf. And there's a little image of them hatching um, to the left hand side there. Um, the larva, the larvae are, um, they, they range from green to brown, but they can't really be identified by their colouring. They're more commonly identified by um, two things. So an inverted Y pattern on their head, which you can see in the image, but other armyworms do have that as well. So then you have to look at um, whether the larvae has um, four dark raised spots at the end of the abdomen in arranged in a square shape. Um, pupae found in the soil most commonly, but they can um, pupate in organic matter or leaf litter above ground. Um, and the adults um, are moths and they range from 32 to 40 millimetres in their wing, wingspan. Um, a really good, a really good point about fall armyworm, which is probably why we've seen such um, fast movement, is because they can really fly long distances and migrate quickly, um, sometimes 100 or so kilometres in one day. This is a good, this is a link to um, a really good cat, uh, a good video on the life cycle of a fall armyworm. So I mentioned the 350 plus host plants, some of them are listed here. So maize and sweet corn, sorghum, rice and grass crops, but it does attack a, a number of vegetables, including beans, capsicum, chili, cucumber, potato, pumpkin, tomato, and more. Um, some of the symptoms to look out for um, in regards to fall armyworm um, in sweet corn, but also in other vegetables. Um, so this includes windowing, tattered leaf margins, um, skeletization and defoliation, but also they can chew right into the leaf as well. Um, and the larvae may hide in the, at the very base of the stem. Um, so make sure you're checking there in your crops as well as um, frass or waste that is left behind by the larvae. Um, so I guess the question being, what do I do if I detect fall armyworm? 
early detection is going to be um, crucial for not only for the grower, but the entire industry um, and to, to know what you need to do to control it. So regularly checking your crops and monitoring for fall armyworm activity or damage is crucial, as well as reporting to the exotic plant pest hotline or your local department. Um, and the number is there. Um, at the moment, Hort Innovation and all of our um, horticulture industries are working with um, APVMA on emergency use permits. So there's some up and running. If you do need more details on that, I'm happy to pass those on if you'd like to contact me. Um, and otherwise you can con obviously consult, well, it's very important to consult your relevant state department um, for pest management advice. And I, they'll probably inform you about the chemicals that are available as well. This is a link to a YouTube video um, that Ausveg has recently developed on fall armyworm that details all of this information, but just in a different format. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'd like to just um, point out a few different um, organisations that we'd like to thank and that we've worked with. So they're all up on the screen. We really appreciate your assistance with um, the Vegetable Leaf Finder project. And if you do need to contact me or would like some of that information, um, my details are there and very happy to um, chat with you about either the Leaf Miner or the Fall Army Work. Thank you. I was on mute, sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was paying attention pretty hard. They're really awful. I thought they were bad, but they are really nasty little bugs. Go WA, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> we get all the good ones. Tron, do you have any questions for Maddie? Uh, yeah, I have a question now. Practical question, actually. <laughs> now, the full army, actually for the full army worm. The yeah. full army worm now recently found or detected in Canavan. What I observed that Canavan tomato grower or other vegetable growth grower used to practice using the grass plant like maize, corn, shokum, uh, yeah. planted around the farm property or within the farm property as the windbreak mm -hmm. or the dust or to prevent dust to the crop. Yeah. So knowing that those grass plants are preferable host for fall army worm. Do you have any special recommendation for the grower if they keep practicing that one or if you have any other alternative, alternative you know, for the grower for that case? Yeah, well, I guess if they, so they've got the windbreaks around their boundaries. I think it's more important now than ever to be monitoring in those boundaries um, for fall armyworm um, because I guess they're going to be found there before they're found in the crop that, the growers in Carnarvon are actually growing to sell. Um, so I guess I didn't go into any detail on the, um, the, the chemicals that are available for growers um, that are like the permits that are available, but they can, I'm happy to pass on that information from the department um, to growers who, are, who need it, um, especially, yeah, in the Carnarvon region because they, they will. Is that kind of helpful for them? Mm. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would just like to say thank you so much, guys, for giving us your time today. Um, all of the information is really, really awesome. And yeah, I got a little bit carried away and kept myself muted. Um, so thank you so much for that. We'll make sure that all of your details are up on um, whatever platform we release this on. But yeah, if guys need to get in touch with you, we'll make sure that they they have all the right details. And I would especially like to say a thank you to our techie for today and uh, the Veg WA comms guru. Uh, she is working behind the scenes, hope, the scenes, hopefully making this seamless and fabulous. But yeah, thank you to Hort Innovation, Ozveg and Vegetable WA for releasing some of the employees to spend some time with it. So yeah, thanks guys. <laughs> Thank you so Enjoy much for having us. <laughs>